All righty, glory to God. How y'all doing, man? It's your boy Charles A.R. We're back again for another week of Cries in the Wild. Such a blessing to be before you again. It's been um, a lot of trials and tribulation going on, which is why today's topic is going to be a very familiar one um, based on tribulation. Um, something that I've been experiencing a lot in these past two weeks. Uh, kind of catch up. I know we missed last week, and I apologize. Um, I shouldn't have allowed what I was personally going through to affect or put a hindrance on what God wants me to do. So um, I'm held accountable for that before God, because um, being a minister and being in a position to preach and teach, I have to understand that I'm going to have to live what I preach and teach. So um, when Satan tries to throw a stumbling block in my personal life, I should not allow it to affect my ministry. And um, I apologize sincerely. For everybody who may or who may not have been looking forward to last week's study that didn't get to see it because it didn't happen i do apologize sincerely from the bottom of my heart but i'm back glory to god um give you a quick rundown not to go into too much detail but last i think it was last week on tuesday i had an opportunity to preach at my church and um, i gave a good word to the um, holy spirit on faith how Peter walked on the water. It was kind of a, a rendition of the study I've done um, a few weeks back on faith. And how Peter walked on the water and um, walked the waves of uncertainty and um, began to be distracted by the winds of the enemy <laughs> as a distraction to pull his eyes off the Savior. And he began to sink immediately. And um, I went into more detail about faith and how we're going to be tested. And um, sure as day, Wednesday morning, I woke up to a test. So, um, I learned a few things from it. I mean, the um, misfortune that occurred was my fault. It was a lack of responsibility. I won't go into too much detail, but it's a financial issue that happened. It was a lack of responsibility on my end. So it was a twofold, well, yeah, twofold lesson that I gained from that. One was be responsible. Um, don't be slothful in business. Um, manage your finances the proper way. And another one was also that you're going to be tested on what you teach. Gave a great sermon on faith. Woke up the next day to a test on it. Um, now, what happened was not of God making that happen. That's one thing we have to understand. When tribulation comes, it's usually from something you've done or from the enemy. You don't want to give the enemy too much credit either. But one thing is the end. You don't want to give him leave way either. Um, something that you may have caused or something that you may have done is come back on you. Um, yes, well indeed. I mean, well, it definitely might be your fault. But Satan will take it and use it as a platform to destroy you. So, um... I'm not giving him credit either, but he did try to take that situation and turn it to a situation would have made it worse if I would have allowed him to, which as you see last week, I didn't get the chance to do the Bible study because of some issues that was going on in my personal life, which should have never leaked into my ministry. But you live and you learn. But God was teaching me, be, you know, if you're going to talk it, walk it. I talked about faith. I preached about it and I got tested and it wasn't my first test. You know what I mean? But notice God didn't tempt me. God does. God is not tempted by any man, nor does he tempt any man. So that was something that happened on um, lack of my responsibility. And it was a, a leave way to give Satan even more room to attack, which he did. Um, and I allowed it to pour in my ministry. But I've learned from that. I thank God I'm still here and I'm finna be blessed even more than I was before I went into that test. So I thank God for that tribulation, which is why I'm going to be teaching today on tribulation. Now, for most of my studies, I do a lot of preparation. I go into the Greek lexicon and, you know, I cross reference and cross examine. But today it's going to be real short, sweet and simple because I'm going to let the Holy Spirit teach this lesson as he has taught all the others. But now, oh, yes, I'm going to let him do his thing today. And um, it's a very familiar situation. I was asking God, what should I teach on today? I've been quite busy this last week with trying to get things back in order. And I just asked God, you know, what do you want me to teach? And tribulation hit my head. Boom. So I'm going to talk about tribulation today. We're going to keep it short, sweet, and simple. I'm not going to be doing a lot of flipping back and forth from referring to two particular scriptures. And I pray to God in Jesus' name that it edifies someone because I've learned a lot this week. And um, I want to share with y'all. Um, what keeps me going when I go through this tribulation and what should keep you going. As we always do, if you're watching or viewing, please bow your head, go into prayer and give God his glory. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, thank you from the bottom of my heart, Father God, for this 
gracious opportunity to teach and preach your word again, Father God. As always, I ask for sound clarity, Father God. Um, we bind every distraction, Father God, every technological difficulty that could possibly arise, Father God, on account of the enemy. We bind that in Jesus' name, Father God. I ask that you anoint and bless the ears and eyes of every listener as well as their hearts, Father God. It's something that may be said during this study through your gracious will, Father God, will prick their heart, God, and lead them to salvation, Father God, or lead them back to you, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All righty. If you have your books, as always, I'm reading out the King James Version. If you choose to read another version, I'll, I'll power it to you. Just try to keep up. I know it's different in particular versions, but I always read the King James Version. We're going to be starting our text off in chapter 5 of Romans, and we're going to read 1 through 6. And once we're done with that, we're going to go to James chapter 1, 2 through 15. Now, the topic, which usually I don't do too much topics or themes for my studies, but this theme is tribulation. And it's about how tribulation should be a springboard to salvation. It should be a slingshot to success and it should be a supplement to your strength. And I'll explain that as we go through, but keep that conscientious throughout the study. This is what the study is about, how you can turn that negative or that attack and allow God to... <laughs> Let God to revive it and turn it to a positive, something that's going to work for you, no matter what you go through. God can always turn it around. So this is about turning around your situation today. So get to Romans. I'll give you some time to get to Romans chapter five. We're going to read one through six. And um, like I say, please, as, as I'm doing these studies, get you a Bible. I don't want you to take my word for what I'm reading. Don't ever let anybody just read you something and you don't read behind it. And um, on your own time, go back and restudy this stuff. Make sure I'm on top of my game. Make sure I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. Question everything but God. So um, if you're there now, we're on Romans 5, chapter 5. We're going to read 1 through 6 slowly. Um, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now let's really talk about this text it's nothing super technical and it's nothing that really um needs cross-examination it's common sense let's talk about it though because you have to take this word and apply it to your life the key in the word of god and making it strong for yourself is first of all faith and activation it takes faith to understand and truly discern it and then it takes activation to make it work for your life so let's talk about this it says that I'm I'm honing in on three. Verse three is the main one I'm honing on. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Many people would be like, huh? That's backwards. So why would you want to glory in tribulation? And for those who don't understand what tribulation means, that's struggle. That's test and trials. When you're going through it, when you're walking in the valley and all my Christians can understand what the valley is. It's a very terrible place that no one likes to go but at that point of time your face is being tested there's no sure shot that you're going to come out of it there's no empirical evidence that you're going to get through it the only evidence that you truly have is faith and faith is the faith is the substance of things not seen and the hope it's um well let's go to it because i like to have the, the verses um for a moment We'll get to that in one second. Let's stay on the topic. Okay, so we're talking about how we glory in tribulations, right? And it says, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. When you're going through the vow, I mean the valley, and you're going through that situation, it's not always a quick process. It's something that is very long sometimes, and we never have a, a certainty or an idea when we're going to come out of it. So in that valley, when surrounded by mountains... <laughs> And you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel sometimes. And all you have to operate on is your faith. You can't rely on yourself anymore. You can't rely on your coping mechanisms or your comfort zones anymore. You're completely relying on the faith of God if you're wise. So when it says we glory in our tribulations, knowing the tribulation work at patience, a direct effect if you're wise. 
and you take that and change your angle of perception from a positive a negative to a positive in that situation then going through that tribulation you'll develop patience put it in a, a particular example of your life when you have some financial issues and you can't pay your bills sometimes at that point in time unless you have some money hid up put up or you can go get a loan then you're in god's hands which you always are but then it really hits you that i have no other ways to run i can't go borrow money from this one i don't have a loan here and i don't have anything in the bank so for that period of time you don't really know how long it is but you have to wait now what you do in that period of time is key you can sit there and lay in your depression and let satan use that that, that time of uncertainty to destroy your faith, or you can let it be a building block to your faith, a rudiment to your faith, and understand that there's nothing I can do in my physical will right now, so this is completely up to God. It's in God's will at this point in time. There's nothing I can do to solve this situation. So therefore, you develop patience. Now, when you look up that word patience in a Greek lexicon, and please forgive me if I slander this word, but <laughs> it's huponime. Upaname is a definition of endurance and steadfastness, patient waiting for when you're going through something. So when we talk about patience, it's basically that, that situation where it's like, hey, it's nothing I can really do right now. I can sit here and stress about it, which ain't going to change anything. Or I can sit here and be faithful in knowing that the God that we serve is going to pull me out of the situation in due time. That's the thing. We work on a different time scale as God work on. God works on a scale that we can't even comprehend with our minds. Our minds are not strong enough and we don't have enough discernment to understand the timetable that God works on. We think that we should be out of it in a day, a matter of seconds or a matter of months. God may be looking at years down the line. We don't know, but we have to go through it and be patient in the midst of that tribulation. So therefore we go from tribulation as a direct result of tribulation through that tribulation, you're going to develop some patience if you're wise and you use the tribulation for the right way. Now, next, we see when we go to four, it says in patience, experience, so that from that patience that you gain from being in that situation of tribulation, you gain experience. It's stating you've been through it. So if you ever do go back through it again, it's a familiar place. You have an understanding of what it took to get through it the first time, which is why directly after the experience, you get hope. As we see in verse four, it says in patience, experience and experience hope. Now, we start back off at tribulation. This is the issue that you're faced with. You're faced with a problem. You're in a real sticky situation. You're in the valley. If you use this tribulation the right way, it can be a springboard to salvation or a slingshot to success or a supplement to your strength because through that tribulation, you gain patience to wait on God, trust on God, to understand that you don't really have anything in your control. When you really wake up out of the sleep you're in and the veil is removed from your eyes spiritually, you'll see that you've never had control. You only thought you did. When you relinquish that control to God, to Jesus, our one and only God and Savior, then you'll understand that you put your control in his hands and you have true control. When you put yourself in God's hands, you're in better hands than all state. I'll tell you that. You have the best insurance you could possibly get. So what I'm saying is when you go through that tribulation, you develop patience to understand that God is going to pull you out when he is ready. In the meantime, you should be praying, fasting and studying the word of God. Do not let it destroy your regiment. If anything, it should be a building block to build a strong regiment of prayer, fasting and studying. So when you do go back through this tribulation or face different tribulation, you have a way to come out of it. So from that patience, now we develop experience. Been here before, done that, came out of it. So that's why from the experience, you develop hope. So when you face this situation again, you face this stronghold or this tribulation again, you have hope to make it out of it. So you see, there's a progression there. There's a process. And a lot of people don't like to get the process. They like to go directly from tribulation to hope. Tribulation to be pulled and out of, to being pulled out of the tribulation. But God will allow you to go through a process. It's called refinement. We spoke about it before. Um, a potter, when he's making a new piece, right? and molding that clay has to go into the furnace under extreme temperatures to be refined to be made solid to be strong and have substance it has to go through the fire the fire process is not a very pleasant process but when he pulls that thing out and thumps it and he gives it a sound he knows it's solid done complete mature perfect in the word of god to be mature and complete when that piece of pottery is made perfect through that fiery furnace which no one likes to go through then you'll understand that the outcome is worth it. So it's the same situation we're going from tribulation to hope, but everyone wants to jump directly from tribulation to hope or jump from the grotesque piece of clay to the masterpiece without knowing there's a process in between it. 
when we go through that process, as uncomfortable as it may be, it's worth it. Because God knows that you can make it through that process. It says God will never give a man put on um never put more on you than you can bear, and that's the truth. He knows your breaking point. Therefore, he puts you through this process and you gain strength through this process. You gain understanding and knowledge and wisdom through this process. So as we see the process, starting at tribulation, patience, experience, hope. So when you're praying for patience, be prepared for tribulation because it's the springboard. It's the rudiment to developing patience. How can you be patience for something, have patience for something if you get it right away? That's why, you know, to take it to a, um, a carnal understanding, I remember in high school, you see a lot of these kids that had a lot of money and their parents were buying these brand new cars. They never worked for it. So therefore, when they get the car, they don't, they take it for granted. They don't appreciate the car. They wreck it and have a new one the next month. And the parents wonder why they don't appreciate the car because they never had to work for anything. Me, I had to work for my first car. I enjoyed my first car. Now, I didn't know much about cars, so therefore, it was hard for me to maintenance it, but I appreciated that car. I was thankful for it. I had gratitude for it. Same thing with salvation. I had to go through a process to get that salvation. It wasn't microwave process. Like, we have this mindset, and a lot of churches are guilty of this. A lot of pastors are guilty of this. This whole microwave salvation thing. Say the sinner's prayer, you're saved. We read biblically, we know that that's not the truth. That's why I say, know your word. Follow the word word for word have a discernment of it not intellectually but spiritually and you understand that salvation is a process it's something you have to condition your heart for it's not that god is holding that salvation back from you and saying you're not gonna get it till this certain time no he's waiting on you to condition yourself to be put in a place to receive that gift that he's trying to give you I'm not gonna force the gift down your throat therefore it's a process i know i went through a process for my salvation it was a lot of tribulation it was a lot of patience I had to go through, a lot of experience, but all of those developed hope. So now, like what, what happened last week, though I've never been in that particular situation before, it's still tribulation, which is a familiar place for me. Though it had me almost broken when it first happened, I remember this process that I went through in other situations and it helped me come out of it, which is why I can stand before you on this Monday and teach faith renewed. It made me stronger. That's why I say your tribulation should be a springboard to salvation, a slingshot to success, and a supplement to strength. Now, in my case, it's a supplement to strength. I've already got salvation. Thank God. Thank the Lord for that. But now I'm being supplemented more strength through this tribulation because I know that in those situations, especially this one I went through, I had no one to trust but God. There were no valid, uh, tangible answers at that point in time when I woke up Wednesday morning to what I woke up to. But guess what? When I did fall, because I did, guess where I landed? On my knees. And I began to call on Jesus and ask Jesus, God, what is it? I don't know what it is. Um, it's not comfortable, but I know the God I serve. And you said in your word, you never leave me nor forsake me. And I know that my best interests are in you. That you have my best interest at hand. Unlike other people, you have my best interest in your mindset. And you know that I'm going to overcome this. So then I began to prep myself and build myself up. Because I remember that I've been through worse things before. And I came out of them because I trusted in God. Not because I made something miraculous happen. Or that I did something. Or I had control of the situation. But no, because I relinquished it to God. So there, we're going, there again, we see that process. Tribulation. It's like a house tribulation boom that's just your foundation bomb it comes it builds up to that patience to that experience and in that roof is your hope <laughs> in that particular context we could use the house structure for that particular context you definitely don't want to build your house you know we all build a house on faith which is the rock jesus but in that particular situation tribulation can be a building block to a great home depending on how you utilize it i was speaking to a young man that i worked with and um I work at Stuart March from the Beach House, which is a shelter for kids who have, you know, certain issues, behavior issues. And the kid was like, you know, it sucks being in here. And I'm like, you don't know what God possibly saved you from by being in here. Now, don't get me wrong. Your decisions led you here. But God can take that situation and bring you out of it and make a plus out of that negative. So I told him, change your angle of perception. The way we view art and the way we view the world is how we perceive it. So if you look at it as a negative thing, then always you're going to be biased to that. Most likely your outcome is going to be negative because of how you perceive the situation. Shift over to the left or the right a little bit in faith. And I guarantee you, God will show you the positive out of that situation. And sometimes you're going to be in a situation where at that point of time while you're in the storm, you're not going to see a positive out of that situation. 
But that's where your faith comes in hand. That's truthfully where this all boils down to your faith. How much do you truly believe in God? Like I said, I preach faith on Tuesday night. But boy, I sure got a test and a lesson in it on Wednesday morning. That quick bomb. Because of something that I did or didn't do, should I say, being neglectful on the situation, I woke up to a test. And Satan at that point in time was, oh yeah, I got him. I got him. He's down. He's not doing Bible study this Monday. Oh yeah, I got him. But then boy, a few days ago, I got on my knees. I began to worship God and labor and worship before God. And I got revitalized. I got reboosted. I got, oh yeah, I'm back now and on point and stronger than it was before I went through that process. The righteous should suffer persecution, know that. But also know that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. So that's when you get hard in prayer. That's when you get back into your regiment. And when you come out of that, don't get content. Don't get comfortable thinking that, you know what I mean? This is the last test. You're going to be tested continually. So if anything, keep that regiment going. Like I said, anybody can praise God when things are good, when it's sunny outside. But can you praise God in the rain? Can you praise him when it seems like everything around you is falling apart, when you have no answers, when you're in the midst of the valley, in the midst of the tornado and eye of the storm, and all you see is rubbish flying around you, destruction, disaster, and defeat? Can you still pierce through all of that on the other side and see the outcome? And if you can't see the outcome, can you trust in Jesus that he knows the outcome? Because he knew that you was going to go through this before you were even born. God sees front and back, back to four, all around us. He's got you covered on all ends. He's omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. Can you trust in him? So this is the key of what I'm speaking about is how this tribulation in the beginning, something that no one likes, took you through a process where you gradually build up into hope. Not overnight, tribulation. You go from tribulation to patience, experience, and from experience to hope clearer example of how that tribulation could springboard you to salvation slingshot you to success and be a supplement to your strength now i want us to go over to james 1 and 2 and these verses people this is not something that i looked up today and just was like oh i want to study on this no this is something that means something to me because i, I live it and i experience it, and this is what got me through my process anybody know me i always quote james 1 and 2 count it all joy my brethren when you fall into diverse temptations Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be imperfect, that ye may be perfect, entire wanting nothing. So we're going to read, um, if you can scroll over to James 1, chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 2 through 15. Get some more information on it and we'll wrap it up. We're not going to be, not going to have you uh, tied up much longer. I just want to really get this out. So um, go ahead and flip. This is general epistle of James. Right after Hebrews, give you some time to get there. I want you to read along. And the theme is the testings of faith. Perfect for this example. So if you're there, we're going to go to James 1. We're going to start at verse 2, and we're going to read to 15 slowly. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this. That the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away, for the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Thus when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Wow, it's a lot in that. Now, let's really break this down and truly spiritually discern what this is talking about. It ties right into what Romans is speaking. 
Once again, Romans was speaking of glory and tribulations. What does this say? Starting at three, know this, no, starting at two, my brethren count it all joy, joy when you fall into divers temptations, divers, various temptations, what that mean? Temptation, testing, in this particular context, it means testings. Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation. Doesn't that seem contradictory? Doesn't that seem like the person that said that is out of their mind? But no, that person knows God. And it's telling you when you come out on the other end, you can look back into that situation and see where you progressed from it, where you've been blessed by being in the tornado and the storm. Because when you come out, you appreciate the calmness more and then you're prepared for when the enemy strikes again. You won't get content, comfortable and let your guard down. You'll fast stronger. You'll pray stronger. You'll submit to God more. You'll trust in him. You'll exercise your faith and activate his word more. Because you know how quickly things can go from sunny day to a tornado to an earthquake to a monsoon. That quickly, in the blink of an eye, none of us are promised the next second or the next day. So when you go through this, you count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, the testing of your faith, worketh patience. Now remember what Romans says, tribulation worketh patience, patience experience and experience hope. My God, can you not see how much correlated, how much uh, this correlates to Romans? Knowing that the testing, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Wow. But let patience have her perfect work. Mm, that says a lot. Let patience have her perfect work. What does that mean? When you're going through with it, don't stress don't try to rush out of your situation. Let God refine you while you're in the furnace. Don't try to jump out of the furnace before it's time. Lord God, I did a uh, uh, the testimony, or better yet, should I say, the scripture and the sermon that I did on Tuesday was about faith, right? And I used Noah's Ark and the boat that Peter got out of in Matthew. Yeah, the boat that Peter got out of when he walked on water and then the Noah's Ark. And I described it like this. I said, by faith. Noah was led into a boat, the ark, right? In the boat for safety by God. He was walking in there and led in there by faith. He didn't have to do that. By faith, he, he came into the ark, built the ark and came into it. And in retrospect, in the New Testament, Peter, by faith, was led out of a boat, out of a comfort zone, out of safety to walk on the waves of uncertainty. Now, both of them were walking into an uncertain situation that only by faith they could walk into it. Noah walking into the ark by faith. There was no empirical evidence that he was going to walk in that ark and that ark was going to be built to the specifications that could withstand the water that it was going to face or the devastation or the tribulation or turmoil that was ahead. And there was no way that Peter had any empirical evidence that when he walked on the water to go meet Jesus that he wasn't going to sink. Now, depending on how you look at this, that ark that Noah walked in, I look at that as a church. We all need to come into it. That's where we get built up. That's why our faith gets stronger. That's where we get refined and edified. But there's a time and a season when God is going to call you out of that boat. Now, what I'm talking about the church in this particular term is that local office. Boom. We go into the, the church. We go every Sunday, the building. You know, there's that church and there's a church without walls. And that's the ecclesia. But right now I'm talking about talking about the church with walls. We get called into that church to get saved, built up, edified, strengthened. But then there comes a season where we must walk out of that church. You know, we're coming in. Peter walking out comfort zone because you can get in the church and get so comfortable sometimes that you don't want to go evangelize. And as I said, a great man, Elder Tom, Elder uh, Lawson, thank God for him, taught me that Noah's Ark was built from the inside out, inside out, just like a house. You start with the foundation and the frame and then you go work on the outside. The same thing with the ark. Same thing the way the church is supposed to operate inside out. Get your strength from the inside, meaning you have to come in. Build it up, then go out and evangelize and do your work on the outside of the church in the physical sense is what I'm saying. So when I was talking about that, there was a patience, though. The whole key of that was that Peter didn't get on the water until Jesus said, come. Because he said, Jesus, if it be you bid me to come on the water to you. And he made the proposition, but he didn't come until Jesus said, come. And then he walked out. It was his season. It was his time. It was for the faith to be truly tested because that boat represented a comfort zone for him, safety for him. Anybody to walk on that water would have been half crazy, but he had faith. And that was when his faith was tested. 
But remember to keep your eyes off the distractions of the boisterous winds and keep your eye on the Savior because he did begin to sing. But he did ask, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. But what I'm taking out of that context is that he didn't come out of that boat till God said, come. He didn't step on that water until God said, come. He gave him to go to. We don't know when it's time for us to be pulled out, pulled out of the furnace is what I'm saying in retrospect. We don't know when the edification process is done or when the strengthening process is done and we're ready to go out there and fight our Goliaths and move mountains into the sea. We don't know when because you might try to pull yourself out too early and not be solid and you still be clay and not a strong structure ready to go up against the wiles of the devil. So therefore, letting patience have her perfect work, meaning you wait in that tribulation or in those temptations and you let patience do her job. You let God do his job. It says, let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect. What does perfect mean in the Bible? We spoke about this before. Mature and complete. Not walking flawless. Not saying you're sinless. Not saying you, you know what I mean? Mature, complete, full grown in the word of God. So it's saying, let patience have her perfect work that ye may be in perfect, entire, wanting nothing. A complete man of God. Let patience do her thing. Let God and his process work. Just post it on Facebook. Get out of the way of progress and get in line with it. We hold ourselves back from progress. My own inhibitions, own weaknesses, own lack of faith, own doubt. We say, okay, God, I want you to work me and mold me. But hold up, I'm not ready for that yet. I'm going to try to do it myself, God. Hold up, I got this one. I call you on the next round. And then we fight it on our own and we get whipped every time. We get in the midst of that tribulation. We want to come out of it so quick that we try to come out of it with one of our own tactics and we come out worse than we did when we walked in. Let me tell you something. It's just like the church. You come in there, you get a good sermon, you get an emotional response, and you walk out of the church the same way. That ain't how it's supposed to be. You come in that church seeking salvation. You come in there for a word to build you up that you leave better than you came in. The same way we should look at tribulation. We don't always walk into it on our own. We don't always know when it's coming. We don't necessarily want to be there. But when you come out, you make sure you leave with more than you came in with. And sometimes it's going to take you to lose everything in tribulation physically and materialistically to come out spiritually with more than you walked in with. So the same thing applies. So we're going to keep going here. Uh, well, actually, we did. We rolled through 15. My bad. <laughs> Let me get back right. All right. We went through 15. But it says, let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. So when you ask for something, when you're praying to God, God, pull me out of this tribulation when it is your will. You ask in faith, like you ask anything else, in faith, wavering not. Don't be tossed to and fro like the waves of the sea. Now, when you see seven, it says, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of God. So when you ask, you ask in faith. That's it. The same way Jesus healed people. He asked them, do you believe you can be healed? By their faith, they were made whole. God didn't force that miraculous thing on them. By their faith, they was made whole. That's it. Your faith. Is it strong enough? Do you believe that you're going to receive what you're asking for? Are you asking with doubt? Are you coming to God doubting already? Or do you believe that he can do what he said he'd do if it's in his will? So when you ask, you ask with faith. Don't waver. Now, eight says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Wow. That's very important. I was definitely once a double-minded man. I trust God, but I don't. I believe in God, but I don't. I'm patient, God, but I'm not. You're double-minded, so you're unstable. You're like a drunk man trying to walk a narrow line. It's impossible. Your mind is in two different places. One second you're on this side of the gate, the next second you're on that side of the gate. One second you trust in God, the next second you doubt him. One second you're blessing him, but when you go through tribulation, you're cursing him. You can't be double-minded. And it says, but he, but the rich, this is verse 10, no, actually, let's read verse 9. It says, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. For those going through stuff, if you've ever been overlooked your whole life or never really had much, glorify in that because one day you will be exalted. It says the humble should be exalted and those who exalt themselves should be abased. And it was a, it was a story that I really like. And it went something to this effect. And read it on your own time, please. But it was talking about, you know, those who want to sit up front all the time in the gatherings. 
and you go up front and you might sit in someone else's seat and get pulled to the back. He said, oh, well, a humble man might go to the back, though, to sit in the back. And someone will say, hey, you can come sit up here with us and bring you to the front. Great example of the humble being exalted because they were humble, didn't want to be seen in the front, didn't want to sit up there and be of high decree, but went and lowered themselves and humbled themselves to sit in the back. And someone asked them to come up front. So for their humility, they were exalted. Now, for the other person who wanted to exalt themselves, they were abased. Go to the back. You sit in somebody else's seat. That's not your seat. Wow. So for those who go through things, whether it's financially or whatever, for the man of low degree, rejoice in that, for you shall be exalted in due time. Number nine says, number 10 says, but the rich in that he is made low because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. So for all of you that are made significant or feel like you're exalted because of your financial status or social status understand that that's temporal and that you shall be abased if you continue to operate in that thinking that that makes you who you are truly doesn't prosperity people got that definition twisted it's not financial prosperity that god is speaking about you can be prosperous in health you can be prosperous in the spirit you can be prosperous in cheerful giving you can be prosperous in life without finances People tend to hone in on that because society has made it to a point where if you're not making a certain amount of money a year, then you're nothing or that you're lower than someone else. But let me tell you something. As it says, the ones who exalt themselves should be abased. You will get humble. God has a great way of doing that. You're tripping, falling on your own sword like Saul did. So the key is, is if you're going through it as hard as it may be, glorify it. God is not looking over you and he has not left you. He's got you. And though you may struggle on this earth and may be poor on this earth, you're going to be rich in heaven. Now, that's where your faith kicks in at. Some people say, I don't want to wait. And they make sacrifices and they sacrifice their own salvation to get something temporal. Anything that you obtain on this earth out of materialistic physicalities and carnality is going to perish one day. It says that's why you should lay your treasures up in heaven where no moth or dust can corrupt. Lay your treasures in heaven. What is your treasure in that salvation? kingship walking with god your crown that's what you need to be fighting for now everybody likes to have nice things and be stable and that's great and if it's for you god will make it humble yourself and i guarantee you if it's for you god will bless you with it too many of us want to pray for things that we think are blessings that if we get them and we're not in the right spiritual state they're going to corrupt us and destroy us god knows that and that's why a lot of times the things you pray for that you think is in his will you don't get because that's not what he wants you to have because he knows if you get it in the state that you're in spiritually now you're not going to be able to maintain it and it's going to become a curse and not a blessing so be careful what you wish for and that's basically what i'm talking about here like it's telling you to glorify in lowliness to glorify and going through things because I guarantee you your reward is in heaven and it says um let's go to um 12 it says blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried tested he shall receive the crown of life, which that which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And this is the key. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth any, any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and is enticed. Now, what that's saying is um, like what I went through. I could have said, oh, God, why'd you do this to me? You done did this. I just preached and sown all these good seeds. And here you go testing me. That was because of what I did accountability people well, i know a lot of that satan this satan that and let me tell you something a lot of times y'all make it easy for satan everything that happened to you ain't satan sometimes you're doing it yourself now don't get me wrong in retrospect satan take that mess up or that screw up that you did and turn it into an opportunity to try to destroy you but stop making it so easy for him now do i believe in spiritual warfare yes i do i live by it i know that there's another realm that we fight in that many people can't even see because of the veil over their eyes and they think they're fighting a physical war when really it's a spiritual one. But I know also that every little thing that happens ain't Satan. A lot of times it's you, your own mistakes, the things that you don't want to be accountable for. So you try to put it off on the dark forces and say, oh, it's his fault. Take some self-accountability. That's why I say examine yourselves that you be in faith. Examine yourself. Stop focusing on him. Get yourself right internally spiritually set and strong in the rudiments that you need to be doing get your regiment going you feel me praying studying and fasting and the enemy you'll destroy him anyways it's good to know that he's there but also don't make it easy for him 
stop doing stupid things and being um neglectful and irresponsible in so many ways that you make his job easy for him. Sometimes he just lay back probably like, hey, they're doing all my work for me. All I have to do is capitalize off the issues that they create themselves. So what I'm telling you is not saying that don't regard him and know that he's not there. Oh, he's there. My buddy is on you. That's his job. But sometimes you make it easier for him is what I'm saying. And don't sit there and blame God for the things you're going through. That's you. But know that, boy, if you do this, I guarantee you, this is what I really want to get to. We're done with this part. I can close this now. Thank God for his word. Let me tell you something. When you go through something, I dare you to try this. Next time you're going through some tribulation, and I'm going to be an eater of my own word as well. Start to give God glory in the midst of it. When the tribulation is at your door and the wicked one is knocking at your door trying to break down and destroy everything and pillage through your home, I guarantee you, when you begin to shout, thank you, Jesus, in the midst of it, you will confound him. I guarantee you he'll be so confused he won't know what to do with you. I guarantee you he have no choice but to leave you alone after a while because he's like, here I am, striking him with every dart, hitting him with my best shot, and he's still praising God. His main reason to torment you is to take your eyes off of God and start thinking about yourself again. Wow. Poor me. I keep going through all of this and going through all of that. No, you don't even understand struggle. You want to compare your struggle? Put it up to Jesus' struggle and what he did. How God robed himself in flesh to come down here to be whipped, beaten, and spat on. The king of kings and lords of lords to be treated like a peasant to deliver somebody who don't even care about him. A nation of people who didn't even acknowledge him. Put your struggle up against his. Furthermore, if you think you got it so bad, go ride down some of these streets, especially if you're in Daytona, ride down Ridgewood, North Street, some of these areas and out really impoverished and underprivileged areas of Daytona Beach and tell me that you think you got it bad. You you tripping because you couldn't get them new pairs of Jordans or you couldn't pay your car payment or your light bill is bond and these people out there eating out of dumpsters don't know where they're going to lay their head at tomorrow. You better glory in what you got and be thankful for what you got because your situation can always be worse. Look at Job and what he went through. Go through the Old Testament and read Job and look at how this man was blameless before God. That's why when people say nobody's perfect, I don't take that. I'm sorry. Your definition of perfect is flawed anyways because you look at perfect the way the society and a carnal man looks at perfect as being sinless and blameless. And I mean by sinless, I mean flawless, walking on this earth without error. You know, the definition of the Bible, perfection means mature and complete. And this man, blameless, that's a key word, blameless. No one could lay any blame to Job's account. And that's why a lot of us need to look at the definition of what a bishop and a deacon is because it says he must be blameless as well. So when you say that nobody's perfect, you're limiting yourself. Now, I'm not saying you should walk up here and exalt yourselves above others and think yourself righteous and better than anybody. But at the same time, you should always seek for perfection in the biblical sense, being mature and complete. This man, Job, was blameless in the sight of God, not man. God actually bragged bragged on Job but he allowed Satan to test him he allowed Satan to test him he took the heads from Job and allowed Job to be tested this is a man that was blameless blameless before God God bragged on Job but he allowed his kids to be killed his cattle to be destroyed his money to be taken away and struck him with sickness from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet Job still came out of it believing God he went through a phase believe me he went through some stuff but he still came out of it believing in God and came out with more than he had before God blessed him way more than he had before when he came out of that situation so what I'm telling you is when you start to go through this I guarantee you if you begin to shout and praise God and lift his name up in the atmosphere you will confound the enemy don't you understand you're fighting against principalities of the air rulers of this world the prince of the air which is satan you're fighting against the atmosphere because that's where they at that's where these spirits is at that's the whole battle realm and the battlefield that you don't know about because your eyes are so limited to carnal sight that you haven't asked for spiritual sight to see what's really going on around you so you're still fighting swinging your fist at the air when you should be fighting it with prayer fasting and study so what i'm telling you is i guarantee you i dare you to do this and the Bible backs it up. When you begin to go through these things, glory in your tribulations, begin to thank Jesus for what you're going through because thank him for the outcome that you can't even see yet. Thank him for the blessings that haven't even manifested yet but are already done. Begin to shout at the wall of Jericho before it falls. Face Goliath and know that the victory is already done. But trust in God. That's what I'm telling. I guarantee you, you have the enemy so confounded, shocked, and disturbed that he will stop bothering you for a good moment of time because he'll see that everything he throws at you only catapults you to success. 
I, I looked at it like if I could paint a picture of Satan pushing you, right? Just pushing you. No matter what direction he's pushing you in, guess what? God is omnipotent and omnipresent and omniscient. He's everywhere at one time. So if you change your angle of perception and your outlook on your tribulation, and he's only pushing you closer to God, every time he knocks you down, fall on your knees and begin to pray to God, shout to God and thank him. Every time he tries to strip something from you, make sure that you give the glory to God and not him. Take your focus off that him and focus on God because God already won that battle. Your battle is fighting yourself now, your old ways, your sin, your sin, your flesh. You can't fight that spirit unless you're in the spirit realm. So what do you do? You put all your importance and your love and your trust in God. And I guarantee you he'll destroy the enemy when it's time. The victory has already been won, but will you claim it? Will you shout at the wall of Jericho before it falls? Will you glorify in your tribulations? Will you count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations? Will you trust God in these situations where it seems like there's no outcome that is good? Will you allow God to see the victory for you? Because God has already preordained you and God has already foreknown who's going to come to him. And God already knows the victory before the stumbling block is laid. He knows how he's going to pull you out of it and everything that he allows you to get in. He'll provide a way out of it. Will you trust in him? Or will you only shout and praise God when the sun is out? Will you only shout and praise God when you get the checks coming through and the money's good and everybody's healthy? Will you still praise God when it all falls down around you? When you're in the midst of the valley, when you're facing your Goliath, when you're facing your mountain, will you still praise God the same way, if not stronger, than you did before? Let me tell you something. Faith is going to be your key. Or a song about it a long time ago. Life is like the weather. You don't know when it's going to change. It's sunny, then it rains. There's love, then there's pain. So keep you one umbrella for the weather. That's the word. And verses can protect you when the weather is absurd. If you're going to walk in it, we don't know the seasons. They change. The same way that the weather changes, your life changes. Your situations change. You can go from being up top one day to being knocked down the next day. From Tuesday, preaching a sermon about faith, being on top of the world because God has blessed you to go from the pew to the altar to now preaching in the pulpit to Wednesday waking up with something stripped from you that you really need. To being truly tested in your faith, can you still hold that same glory and that same love you have for God when you're chopped down? That's the test. That's why I preached on this today, because it's a personal thing that I went through. And I want anybody to know that's in the midst of tribulation or midst of their storm or trials to understand that God has already prepared a way for you out. But there is a time and a season for you to come out. Let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and tired and wanting nothing. Do not let Satan use your conviction as a bed of depression and oppression to lay in it and feel like, well, I already messed up here. Let me go further. I've done it. I've been there. Let that be a slingshot to salvation, a springboard to success and a supplement to your strength. That's all I got to say. Holy Spirit has done his job. I'm done. I'm not here to blab before you and stretch this out to three hours. But I pray to God that somebody's been edified by it. I pray to God that this wasn't just a bunch of talking and a bunch of scripture reading. I pray to God that you're going to do some personal seeking within your life to prepare for the trials to come. And when you go through them to understand how much glory is going to come out of them to God, if you trust in him. You know the process. Tribulation work with patience, patience, experience and experience hope. Hope is a great end result, but guess where it started? Tribulation. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith worketh patience. Let patience have a perfect work that ye may be entire, wanting nothing. Perfect, entire, wanting nothing. So we were in Romans 5, 1 through 6, and James 1, 2 through 15. Pray to God that somebody was blessed by it, as we always do. We'll close out in prayer. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, thank you, Father God, for your magnificent word, Father God. We glorify your name, Father God, not only in the great times and enjoy, but also in tribulations, God. Father God, right now, in Jesus' name, I pray, God, that someone's heart has been touched, Father God, that someone's questions have been answered, Father God, that someone sees the light at the end of the tunnel, Father God, that someone trusts you in the midst of the valleys that they may be about to occur or come up on, Father God, that someone understands that by faith in you, they're going to come out of the next storm that may be on its way, Father God. 
Jesus Christ, I just ask you to continue to guide us, Father God. Guide me as a teacher and as a preacher, Father God, to preach sound word and sound doctrine and from a place of love and not hate or strife, Father God. Allow the listeners to be touched and pricked, Father God, that they may be brought to salvation, Father God, that righteous sorrow may lead them to salvation, Father God. And for those who have strayed away, God, that this may be a magnet to pull them back in, God. Use this platform for your glory and not mine, Father God. Use this platform to lift your name up and not mine, Father God. Use this platform to reach those, Father God, in the darkness and bring them forth to the true everlasting light. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I ask the viewers, please, to keep me in prayer as well, because believe me, in the position that I'm in, I'm going to be tested as well. I'm going to be hit everywhere with every shot. The test is not over, but God is good. Let me tell you something. I'm going to glorify him because I'm still alive with breath in my lungs. I'm still able to sit before you today and preach. And from the future on, Lord willing, I will not allow Satan's attempts to leak into my ministry. For the things that I go through personally that I may have caused, I will not let them be a platform to destroy what God is bringing about right now. Keep in mind, February 22nd, I'll still be doing these every Monday. Might switch it to bi-weekly. I don't want to feed too much and, you know, people can't catch up with the videos. But I'm going to have a lot on my plate because starting February 22nd, I'm going to be on Rich Kid Radio with a two-hour slot. Glory to God every sunday from three to five i'll be preaching and teaching on that station it's an online station so you can catch it it's based out of detroit but you can watch it online at any time also just like these the um the, the broadcast will be archived for people who don't can't catch it on sunday from three to five but if you want to get your church on on sunday from three to five at the church or if that's the only church you can get whatever get it though I will be on live. I'll also be playing some new gospel music so if you're a gospel hip-hop artist and you want to get some music out there let me know I'll play it. It's not just going to be my music. Believe that. I'm going to be playing some old school music. If you have any requests, let, requests, let me know. Um, you can go on Facebook and see some of the flyers for um, our first show. will be on the 22nd. So um, I ask you to continue to pray for me that God is going to bless this ministry and um, allow me to continue to do what I'm doing and even on a larger scale only for his glorification. So I love y'all. Y'all stay encouraged. Y'all stay blessed and keep me in prayer as I will keep y'all in prayer. Feel free to contact me on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash Charles A-R-S-M-F. Hit me up at my email at criesinthewild at gmail.com or even comment on the videos here. And if you can't watch them live, you can watch them some on here. And for the ones that are outdated, I put those on YouTube. Um, just look up Cries in the Wild Bible Study. Anyway, feel free.